Thank you, Colleen. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Great audio. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, good morning again. Uh, just get this started here. So, first of all, who am I? Uh, so, that's probably a question with a longer answer than I'm going to answer right now. Uh, but most recently, I was at Virginia Commonwealth University, where I completed a PhD in Integrative Life Sciences. Uh, and essentially, that means that I got a a mix of both bioinformatics and wet lab microbiology, at least in my case, um, primarily focusing on protein-protein interactions. So that's something that I'll talk about a, a quite a bit more in this talk. Uh, and additionally, uh, I am now at uh, the Heart BD2K here at UCLA, where uh, they're quite familiar with, with proteins and their many functions, so usually in more the context of the heart. So I'll just give a general overview of the kind of concepts that I'll be talking about here, and then I'll get into the, the details. So what do we know in general about protein interactions? Well, we know that we can understand protein functions through their interactions, and in uh, perhaps the most simple way, we can think about those as binary interactions, say protein A interacts with protein B. Uh, and when I'm talking about an interaction here, I'm really just talking about kind of a, a stable, uh, perhaps a binding between those proteins A and B. Uh, and usually we, we can assume that that's performing. Yeah. The other oh, is it showing the other screen? Pardon me, I have some technical difficulties. It's. Yeah. I just need to repair something here. Do you have like notes? Uh, yeah, it must be. Oh. Two. Oh, it looks good now? Okay, well, sorry about that. Sorry about the technical difficulties there. Um, I hope no one missed terribly much there, but I'll just uh, mention that protein functions are, are, or we understand protein functions a little bit better through their interactions. Uh, but perhaps the more important concept here is understanding protein functions through sets of interactions. But we know that any one protein is likely to interact with a number of other proteins, uh, and through this we establish them as a series of binary interactions which we can assemble into a network. Uh, and it's through those sets of interactions that we understand uh, the complexity of that network. Uh, and luckily, uh, we have some ideal systems for studying these interactions in bacteria. Uh, they're very convenient because we know that their, their genomes, uh, unlike many more complex organisms, uh, usually have a more manageable number of protein-coding genes uh, in the thousands as opposed to tens of thousands or more. Uh, and we can we can generally have an understanding of the kinds of uh, proteins that, that we expect to find there. Uh, perhaps a, another, uh, another benefit of, of having bacteria as these ideal systems is that they're much easier to uh, perturb the networks with. For example, if we want to drop out what looks like a critical element of that network, it's relatively easy to grow up a, a bacterial culture and, and see what happens when we do so. So there are a lot of benefits to studying bacteria, and that's uh, just one reason why uh, why I studied them during my recent research. So uh, as part of this research, I've, I've worked with three uh, general concepts. First of all is protein complexes. So this is one way that we can understand how protein interactions occur in a stable form to have a, uh, a common purpose or function. Uh, so here's just an example of the, the kind of 3D structure that understanding of a, a protein complex. But we can also understand that in terms of the binary interactions between its components. So that's uh, perhaps a more abstract way of, of thinking about the interactions in a complex. Uh, now also, as part of this, this presentation, we'll be talking about orthologous groups. So essentially, in, in the case of microbial biology, we don't always necessarily know what the, the ancestral gene uh, of a particular sequence is. So when we're talking about orthologous groups, we're often talking about the predicted uh, sequences with a shared common ancestor. That is, we we see similarities between sequences, so we, we cluster them together into these orthologous groups, uh, and we can infer that similar sequences likely have a, a similar function as well. 
So why does it matter to even be talking about bacteria in the, in the first place? I know not everyone necessarily uh, works on them, but they're a ever-present concern, especially to clinicians. Uh, so in a recent CDC report, uh, they revealed that the estimated minimum number of illnesses and deaths, respectively, uh, in the U.S., uh, just due to antibiotic-resistant microbial infections, uh, is around 2 million and 23,000, respectively. Uh, so, and that's just in the U.S., of course. Uh, and just uh, due to antibiotic-resistant bacteria uh, or, and, and yeast uh, infections, as well as fungal infections in that context. Uh, but bacteria are, in fact, uh, not always the causative agent of the, of the disease uh, and often occur in the context of other disease. Uh, Staph aureus, in particular, is, is a known infamous uh, infective agent, uh, causing things like bacteremia and endocarditis, uh, but there are certainly other uh, major uh, Bacterial pathogens like uh, Clostridium difficile, often opportunistic uh, and arising after uh, extended antibiotic use. Uh, Streptococcal infections are actually quite common. Uh, but those staph infections uh, in particular were recently recognized as uh, from the WHO uh, report that came out recently uh, as being a uh, one of the primary bacterial pathogens on the planet, in part due to its uh, emergence of uh, multidrug resistant strains. Uh, so we know that bacterial infection is a, is a major factor in disease, and without effective antibiotics, uh, many of even the more uh, antibiotic-sensitive strains of bacteria could uh, have greater and greater mortality rates. Uh, perhaps the worst-case scenario being the pre-antibiotic era, where we knew that even just in the case of Staph aureus bacteremia, uh, the mortality rate was well above 75%. Now, hopefully, we'd never reach that, where it's currently less than 20%, at least in the U.S., for uh, Staph aureus bacteremia, at least, uh, but without uh, proper antibiotics and the emergence of new antibiotic, antibiotic resistant strains, uh, it may certainly get worse. So we certainly need better ways of understanding uh, how bacteria work and in some cases are uh, more pathogenic. Uh, so understanding bacterial protein interactions in general may improve our ability to address bacterial infections in particular. Uh, and I'd also like to think that methods for studying bacterial protein interactions uh, certainly apply to protein interaction networks for other species, certainly, uh, even beyond microbial proteins. So what's interactomics? And more specifically, what is an inter interactome? Uh, so once again, bacteria allow us to view these kind of things in a relatively simple context. So here on the left, I've provided a, a very minimal example of uh, what a, a single circular genome might look like. Uh, and in terms of the protein coding genes in that genome, we can assemble a list of what we'd expect to be in the proteome. Uh, now, of course, it's not always that simple in that the uh, protein coding gene set that we have may be incomplete. There may be genes that we uh, we don't even detect when we look for genes. In fact, there may even be proteins that we don't detect, uh, say, if we were to go in there and analyze a, a proteome. So a lot of that depends upon our detection methods. Uh, similarly, there may be genes and proteins that we actually find in a genome or proteome that aren't actually expressed in nature or are expressed in some kind of a uh, a non-functional form, or at least a not uh, entirely biologically relevant form. Or perhaps they're only expressed under a certain uh, biological context. So we already see quite a bit of complexity here. Now, we can still take that list of proteins in a proteome and assemble them into an interactome. So once again, that's based on the interactions that we see among those proteins. And many times, we, we detect those interactions based on proteins in particular library say, for example, by using a method like yeast 2 hybrid, where we're expressing those uh, binary pairs of those proteins in a context often different from their context seen in nature. So that's relatively easy to do, but because we're expressing genes in a context other than where they might normally be seen, uh, we may in fact be expressing uh, the, those gene products in uh, ways that produce uh, artificial interactions that don't actually occur in nature. Uh, similarly, we can analyze interactions by just pulling down entire uh, complexes of, of proteins through affinity purification in that spec. Uh, but it's possible that those interactions, uh, once again, are artificial because we'll see that many proteins associated that don't necessarily actually participate in uh, stable interactions. So um, an interactome really should be a set of the complete interactions across a proteome, but in practice it's it's more of an abstraction, and it's an understanding of the interactions that occur to, could occur rather than the interactions that, that are actually occurring in any particular uh, biological context. 
So getting back to the subject of bacteria, we know that out of any six bacterial protein coding genes, uh, at least one or two of their products are likely to be uncharacterized. Uh, and I'll get into some of the other reasons for this in a moment, but this is one of the main problems that we're looking at when studying bacterial proteins specifically. So by understanding the interactions among those proteins better, we can begin to infer functions for those lesser known proteins. So here those would be the, the proteins shown in gray if each one of these, these circles is a individual protein. Um, so we can begin to infer some, some functions for those uh, just based on their interactions with proteins of known or at least better known function. Uh, and this has actually been a approach that's been quite successful for studying interactomes of some uh, more well-studied bacterial species. So for example, this is a, uh, an interactome of E. coli uh, from 2014. And an interesting thing that they did in this context was that they, they provided this kind of hairball network. So this ends up being a, a common problem on interactome networks, uh, that you have this, this hairball as, as shown here. Um, that's hard to decipher on its own, but if we break it up into kind of component parts, and in this case, even the, the three structures of the complexes, we can begin to see how these interactions form patterns on their own. Uh, so we can begin to reassemble things like DNA polymerases and ATP synthase that we, we know form complexes and we can begin to, begin to see the interactions among individual proteins. Uh, at the lower right, at the label this complex 100 here, we even have some proteins that um, we don't even necessarily have an overall function for, but they do seem to interact and potentially even uh, share functional roles. Uh, this is another good example of how we can assemble data, not just from individual studies, but also from uh, previous studies in literature in much the same way that we could assemble a, uh, a genome based on uh, individual sequences. Uh, so many of these interactomes aren't necessarily the result of single studies, but are rather uh, synthetic. Now, there's another challenge that we run into when we're recon reconstructing interaction networks, and I'll, I'll illustrate it here by showing uh, interactome networks from two different bacterial species. So this is one from Campylobacter jejuni, so that's a, a species that lives in the mammalian gut. Uh, now, in this case, the, the interactome is from 2007, and the authors decided that uh, across more than 1,300 nodes in the network, so each node is an individual protein, uh, and just about 12,000 edges, they had a complete picture of the interactome. And without knowing anything else about it, we just look at that and say, sure, okay, that's a great interactome. Uh, but if we compare that to another species, and so this is from Helicobacter pylori, so also a, uh, a gut resident bacterial species, often associated with uh, rather nasty pathogenesis. Uh, in this case, the network has right around 500 nodes, so that's, once again, that's 500 proteins and just about 1,200, or 12, um, 1,200 edges or so. Uh, now, we can see right away that there's quite a bit less complexity here, and partially that's because there, there are fewer proteins, but there are also much, much fewer edges per interaction. Uh, and we know that part of that is due to differences in construction of the network, differences in detecting interactions between the two studies. But we know that a certain component of it is also due to biology. So how do we actually sort out differences between the biology of these two species and the methods used to construct the networks? And that begins to become a, uh, a very difficult problem. Uh, another issue of this problem uh, is that protein protein interactome networks do tend to have very similar properties overall, just like many other networks have similar properties. And we recognize that many of them are, are scale-free. They have this a very similar structure in terms of the, the degrees of their nodes. Uh, so here I've, I've shown just kind of a uh, classic Barabashi Albert uh, model network, and if you've done any work or, or seen any uh, network biology or even network studies, you may be familiar with the, the name Barabashi. Um, but this is kind of a uh, just kind of a generic model network here, and we can see it right that the node count uh, on a, a log log scale. So essentially, this is the the, uh, the degree, and each node having that that degree in the network. Uh, follows kind of a, a linear pathway. That is, uh, there's a, uh, a number of nodes that have a, a very small degree and very few nodes that have a very high degree. And that's this proceeds linear on, on the log log scale. Now, if we compare that to E. coli, at least in terms of degree versus the total uh, number of nodes at each, each degree, uh, it looks very similar. It seems to mostly have that, that same 
linear trend um, on that same scale. Uh, but if we actually examine the network, and once again this is E. coli, so this is from a real bacterial species, uh, we see that there's actually quite a bit of locality there. There are uh, individual sets of interactions that only emerge at the local level. So if we look at the network as a whole, we won't necessarily see the, the relevance of these individual sets of, of interactions. So we really need to be able to think of this as a, a representation of biological interactions and not necessarily as an entire network at all times, although the network properties of it are also critical to the biological pathways. Uh, now getting back to the property of, uh, of unknown function here, um, which is yet another reason why we want to study the networks, but also another reason why networks can be difficult to understand. Uh, at least when we're dealing with microbial biology, even really well-studied species can have quite a few proteins uh, of unknown functions in the, their proteomes. So here, just uh, as, as per Uniprop, uh, if we're looking at, at all the, the sequence strains and all the, the reference proteomes for E. coli K12, so it's kind of our, our generic E. coli, uh, about 20% about of the proteins in, the, in those proteomes appear to have no really well-known function. Uh, if we compare that to another really common species like Staph aureus, so pretty well studied, still has 46% uh, uncharacterized proteins among um, its uh, reference proteome members. Uh, and if we compare that to yet another uh, lesser known species, in this case A. Shali, uh, which is an emerging pathogen that's known to cause urinary tract infections and its biology isn't terribly well understood, uh, actually about 63% of its proteins are fully uncharacterized. So they don't have, actually have any sequence similarity to anything that we know terribly well. Uh, and unfortunately in this case the, the bug is also resistant to uh, many common antibiotics. So if this becomes a more major pathogen, then we may need to focus more on the actual proteins and protein interactions in its uh, in its its lifestyle. And of course, this is true of, of many bacterial species, and uh, at least among what we sequenced, it's been estimated that only about one percent of bacterial proteins even have annotations from experimental results. Uh, and of course, that's what we'd expect. There are far too many to test individually in the lab. Uh, so we really need computational methods to be able to handle the integration of, of all this data. Uh, now, in fact, if we just look at the entries in GenBank, or even just for the whole genome sequence presence, uh, present in GenBank, um, now about half of these entries, actually more than half at this point, uh, are, are entries just from bacteria, uh, and that number is well above 100 million entries at this point. Uh, so there's no chance of ever verifying the function of every protein individually in the lab. Uh, we really need to be able to, to have bioinformatic methods that, that can handle this. So that's exactly what I did. Uh, starting with some interactome studies that we already had in the lab, I began to uh, investigate them uh, and realized that we did need those bioinformatic methods uh, to address things like inferring protein function. So I broke this up into two separate tasks. Uh, and I'm not going to go over every step of these tasks, but I will uh, talk about them more in, in general shortly. Uh, so the first half was complex comparison, so essentially going through the uh, protein complexes in a particular species uh, and seeing uh, whether those complexes were well conserved across other bacterial species, and from that inferring the, the interactions that we're likely to see, uh, and then expanding that to full interactomes and seeing how well uh, interactomes were likely to be conserved across different bacterial species. Uh, now for some of this, I, I rely quite a bit on uh, protein protein interactions both from the intact database and those curated from uh, the literature as well as orthologous groups or here OGs um, from the EGNOT project. So uh, in terms of protein complex conservation, um, essentially this is answering the question of which proteins interactions we expect to be the most conserved across a particular species. Uh, so if we're comparing two species uh, and we realize that okay, in, in species B there's actually an entire protein missing that's present in species A, we would also expect the interactions that we see in species A to not be present. So that's kind of the, the simplest way to think about it. Um, so we can break that into the hypothesis of interactions in protein complexes should not just be conserved, but perhaps the most conserved uh, protein interactions among bacteria, especially if we know that the, the complex itself uh, is very well conserved and has a evolutionarily conserved function. So if we define a set of, say, in this example, 
uh, for members of a protein complex, uh, whether we have experimental or even predicted interactions for them or not, we can use that as a model for the proteins and the interactions that we would expect to find in another species. So which hypotheses can we actually make about protein complex beyond just their, uh, their evolutionary conservation? Uh, we know that not only they should be conserved, but the interaction conservation should, in fact, reflect interaction uh, conservation. Uh, and we can also expect that different models of protein complexes will, in fact, reveal different conservation patterns. And that certainly makes sense, because if we choose a different set of protein complex members for our model and compare that across species, uh, then we would also expect uh, that we may or may not find all members of those species. So the, the model that we start with uh, naturally defines what our expectations will be. So we need to be very careful about the, the model that we start with. Now, I should be very clear that the remainder of this section of protein complexes uh, doesn't actually concern individual interactions. I'm inferring those interactions based on members of protein complexes, but I'm primarily concerned with conservation of protein complex members. So I'll just briefly talk about what, what I'm, I'm talking about in terms of protein complexes and their, their conservation across species in a, in this case, a non-bacterial example. Um, so this is uh, the proteasome. Uh, we'd like to think we have a pretty good idea of its structure, but much of what we, we know about the interactions among its structure are actually a result of comparisons across multiple species. Uh, so here we have an interaction network uh, that's honestly kind of a mess, and partially that's because it's from, uh, from humans, from a few different yeast species, from three different methods, uh, from both structure and modeling data, from cross-linking, from yeast to hybrid. Um, and it's only by assembling data from all these different data sources and these uh, proteins from different species that we can begin to construct a, a, more com uh, a more complete picture of the interactions that we expect to find among the, the members of this particular protein complex. Uh, and luckily, in this case, the, the proteasome is a relatively well-conserved protein complex, so we, we were able to do that. Uh, now, as for bacteria, uh, what I started with to, to begin comparing them uh, not just from a few species, but from as many species as it could, um, were those model sets. So luckily, or perhaps unluckily, there aren't really that many sets of, of well-defined protein complexes. So I started with, with three sets here, two of them from E. coli, one from uh, the much more simple uh, bacterial species, Mycoplasma pneumoniae. Uh, and I won't actually go into a whole lot of detail because it turns out that that's a little bit too simple to even be useful as a model for comparing to many other species. But at least in the case of E. coli, we have one very well curated uh, set from the EcoSite database. I believe that the INTECH database has since also assembled a, uh, what they call a complex portal uh, to define E. coli uh, and other bacterial protein complexes. Uh, in 2009, uh, Hu et al. also published a mass spec uh, based uh, set of E. coli complexes. Uh, so that's not as well curated, but perhaps uh, more informative, as it may, uh, it may include a number of complexes of a lesser known function. Uh, we also have uh, proteome from at least, uh, and once again, I'm, by proteome here, I, I essentially mean lists of uh, proteins, including the potential members of those protein complexes. And we have those from a few representative species and beyond, but I'll just focus on these species for now, just to keep the, the set a little smaller. Uh, we also have some gene essentiality data uh, for all of these species, so we can compare the essentiality of the, the genes, uh, including members of protein complexes. Um, so uh, I, I went ahead and wrote some uh, Python-based software here that I entitled SpiceNon, uh, based on the fact that it worked with the orthologous groups from the uh, EggNon database to start with. Uh, and once again, by ortholog orthologous groups here, I'm essentially just referring to uh, very similar clustered sets of, of sequences, uh, including uh, protein sequences. And I defined two primary metrics to, to compare these. Uh, across multiple genomes at a time. So here, if we're just looking at a, a very small set of, of five genomes, um, we can either define it as uh, the conservation of a particular sequence as locus conservation, that is the total number of times that it, it is found across genome, uh, with here each different uh, inner color of a box indicating a different gene, and each outer outline uh, indicating membership in a orthologous group. Uh, so locus conservation essentially uh, includes the possibility of paralogy in a particular genome, uh, whereas if we simplify that to OG conservation, uh, we're essentially only counting one orthologous group per genome, and we're limiting the extent 
uh, per allergy on our comparisons. Uh, now this may not make a whole lot of sense in a very small context, but we, we expand that to uh, a number of genomes of different sizes, we do begin to see a, a pattern emerge. Um, so this is uh, with this is a, a a graph of genome size of different bacterial genomes on the x-axis, with each dot uh, in blue and and orange here representing an individual bacterial genome. Uh, now on the y-axis, I've I've included uh, values for average gene conservation uh, across those two metrics. So essentially, for each genome here, we're essentially saying how similar the genomes are to all other genomes in the set. Uh, and interestingly, as we get to the more uh, simple bacterial species, we begin to notice that they, uh, unsurprisingly, become much more similar to uh, all other bacteria. That is, they are enriched for very highly conserved uh, sequences, or at least they appear to be. Uh, and gradually, we, we have uh, essentially a, a power law trend uh, as we get towards larger and larger genomes, and that may be because they're full of much more uh, unique sequences in some cases. In some cases, it's also because they have uh, a greater number of, of paralogs to kind of pad out their, their genomes. Um, now, of course, our, our basic assumption was that the, the members of uh, protein complexes, so those are those, those triangular nodes here, so that's the members of those, uh, those individual genomes just predicted to be members of protein complexes. Uh, now they, we expected them to be some of the most conserved sequences in each genome. And in some cases they are, but in some cases perhaps they aren't as well conserved as we might expect them to be, indicating that perhaps some of those protein complexes uh, aren't as well conserved across species as we may think. Um, so I'm going to start talking about these, uh, these complexes in terms of complex size. Um, and just Shortly, when I'm talking about complex size, I'm not talking about the physical size of the complex. I'm talking about the number of members of that complex. Um, in terms of proteins, uh, for example, here we're, we're talking about four separate unique proteins uh, just by sequence, but if we, we compress those into individual orthologous groups, there, that number may be even smaller. So here, when I'm talking about complex size, I'm actually talking about the total number of, of proteins, but I'm comparing them on the basis of, or, of orthologous groups. So. If a member of an orthologous group is not present in a particular genome, uh, then the, uh, that protein is assumed to be missing from a particular protein complex. So what does complex conservation actually end up looking like if we compare it across species? Uh, so kind of our, na I, pardon me. Um, our naive assumption may be that it would follow something like what we see on the left here. So this is the ATP synthase, F1 complex, so that's not even an entire uh, ATP synthase. Uh, and if we compare that across species, we see that all members of the complex are conserved across at least all these model species. Uh, in most of those species, uh, at least one of the uh, those those members is both present and uh, corresponds to an essential gene as well. So this appears to be a very well conserved, largely essential complex. It can't be uh, removed from the genome without uh, being lethal to the, the bacteria. Uh, in some cases, we have something more like the sus succinate dehydrogenase seen in the middle where we have uh, mostly all or nothing conservation. That is, you don't usually see conservation of individual uh, elements of that protein complex because what would, what would their function be without the other members of that complex? So those are the, the two kind of patterns that we generally expect to see. But here on the right, we have a uh, outer membrane protein assembly complex serving as a model of a stranger type of conservation where we see partial conservation of individual parts of that protein complex in some species, uh, but not in others. Um, so that leads to the question of, are those parts either being replaced by something else in the genome, or the remaining elements that do appear to be conserved, like, for example, in Bacillus cyclus, we just see the BAMB protein and don't even appear to have anything similar to the other sequences present. Uh, then has that complex gained a new function in some other context? And often it's, it's difficult. Uh, to tell, but we can still uh, determine whether similar sequences are conserved. Um, so in fact, if we expand this out to a larger set of protein complexes, uh, shown here with uh, each individual uh, species on the left and each column serving as an individual protein complex, at least as modeled by an E. coli complex, uh, then we see that we do see those uh, different uh, fractional conservation. So again, here, um, if a 
if a particular cell is in green, then all the members of the, that protein complex appear to be present for that species. If it's shown in yellow, there's partial conservation. If it's red, then there's no conservation at all. That is, all the members of that complex appear to be missing. And we see that there's a subset of these, these E. coli complexes that do appear to be conserved, in fact, about 20 of them that are, seem to be fully conserved across all these species, at least. Uh, but there's also a section in the middle where there appears to be very fractional conservation, especially once we get to, um, to the more minimal species, where perhaps they, they've reached a point where they've even begun to, uh, to shed members of these otherwise uh, fairly well-conserved protein complexes, uh, but they, they've kind of optimized the, uh, the number of proteins that they have overall. Um, so, of course, this can be expanded even further, uh, in this case, to, to see if there's any pattern uh, for uh, gene essentiality. Uh, and to be honest, uh, once we get beyond the very well-conserved protein complexes, we don't actually see uh, a whole lot of a consistent pattern. Uh, so I won't actually talk about this a whole lot. And to be perfectly honest, I don't think that gene essentiality data uh, is necessarily a very useful metric when you're comparing a number of species, because the, the data used to produce it is often uh, a little bit too noisy, but uh, we can expand our comparison out to many more species. So in this case, I expanded it to about 900 different bacterial species and strains uh, across 285 different E. coli protein complexes as models, uh, and we do begin to see a pattern emerge once we fix them to a bacterial uh, taxonomy, like I've shown at left. So this is a, a tree based on the uh, the, the ITOL uh, taxonomy, uh, and interestingly enough, it the, the pattern, uh, so E. coli showed down there at the very bottom, in, uh, so that's that, that more greenish section. Uh, as we get farther away from that, as we'd expect, uh, we see a gradual but not consistent breakdown in the conservation of protein complex conservation. So some of this may even just have to do with the way that we understand taxonomy uh, among bacteria, uh, but some of it also has to do with actual differences in uh, protein sequence. Uh, now, of course, getting back to that experimental data, which I mentioned may include a number of protein, uh, proteins and hence protein complex that we don't understand quite as well, uh, we see that there's quite a bit more noise in here. So there's a lot more yellow, uh, kind of just signifying uh, that some of these proteins may not actually be part of the, the complexes as they are defined, but are, are conserved in some other context. Or perhaps uh, they serve some kind of an associated function, but aren't generally understood to be part of a, a physical protein. So the, uh, the situation does end up a bit more noisy than what we'd see with the literature curated complexes. Uh, and just as a quick note, um, we cannot even compare proteins in terms of their interactions. Um, so I'm not going to talk about this in great detail. Uh, feel free to ask me questions uh, at the end of the talk about it. Um, but we can even just kind of abstract proteins into their function, and we see that there's actually quite a bit of uh, cross-functional interaction among protein complexes. So this is just for E. coli in this context. So complexes don't just necessarily interact within their own function, but are in fact quite uh, cross-functional. So overall, I found that complex conservation is quite flexible, but does generally reflect taxonomic boundaries. Um, in some cases, we already use things like uh, ribosome RNA as an indicator of, of taxonomy. So it may make sense in many cases to use these protein complexes as additional uh, taxonomic indicators. Um, now, of course, we've seen the most well-conserved E. coli complexes are those essential to life, things like RNA polymerase. Um, and there is that set of about 20 proteins that are very well-conserved, uh, but that's just a fraction of the overall number of uh, E. coli complexes that we can use as models. Um, we also notice that they are frequently cross-functional. So moving on to interactomes, what would we want to know about them? So at this point, we are actually talking about protein interactions, binary interactions, and not just about protein complexes, but about all of the proteins in a particular bacterial proteome. So what patterns are revealed when we combine that data across multiple or even many different bacterial species? What kind of interactions do we see within those conserved? Uh, and furthermore, can we use those interaction sets to predict interactome sizes? Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that, and I will just say the answer is yes. But how many interactions involve those proteins of unknown function? Can we, can we use interactions to uh, potentially predict further functions? So what do we already know about, about interactomes uh, studies that are out there? And it turns out that it, if we just look at the number of, of publications that are out there already that, that work with multiple protein interactomes at the same time, um, well, there are, no, there are 
certainly more than a, a hundred papers that um, work on individual interactomes and have, have cited them. Um, but if we if we want to start looking at say more than even five at a time, um, in many of these cases there's maybe just one or two papers, uh, and as far as I know they're they're both reviews that essentially just have passing mentions. Uh, so comparing multiple virgin interactions is, is something that uh, that hasn't really been done in a really in-depth way. Uh, now there are databases like Strain where they've essentially combined as much interaction data as they can find and establish orthology between the interactors. Uh, but in a way, those those abstract things even further because uh, I'd like to believe that those aren't actually looking at individual interactomes anymore, uh, but essentially all the potential for all the interactions across any proteins with similar sequences. Uh, so in fact, that that may actually be quite a bit larger uh, than what I would be interested in looking at here. Uh, so what I assembled was uh, the concept of a meta interactome. Um, so this, uh, in a way, is somewhat similar to string, uh, establishes orthology between the interactors. Uh, say, here we have two different species, uh, and as long as there is at least one interaction in a particular species, uh, then we can assemble it into the, the meta interactome there. And we can even compress that further into a consensus meta interactome by uh, compressing those individual interactors into um, individual orthologous groups so that even if we have two proteins that are interacting with the same thing, uh, the same other protein that is, uh, they both end up getting shared in the same orthologous group. So essentially the orthologous groups um, are the ones interacting in a consensus meta interactome and interactions between them are more of the types of protein protein interactions that we'd be likely to see in multiple different species. So uh, the problem with this of course is that data must be consistent for both proteins and species. Uh, but there are certainly ways to, to handle that, so that's exactly what I created uh, a set of software called uh, Network Umbra to, to handle essentially the, the shadow of a network. Um, and of course we, we ran into one, pro, uh, one traditional protein problem again here in that uh, when we assembled the meta interactome we found that uh, quite a bit of it um, included proteins and functions, uh, but perhaps the more interesting problem was that the vast majority of interactions are not even seen in more than one species. Um, in fact, it's I believe it's, it's by these numbers less than 0.1% than uh, of the interactions that we see are, are even seen in, in multiple species at all. Uh, and some of that can be due to orthology assignments, but in some cases, uh, and, and in fact I'd, I'd estimate the majority of cases, uh, is simply because the studies haven't been done. Uh, if someone's produced an interactome, uh, say in a species like E. coli, uh, then we know that there are a number of, of proteins that should be present in other species and we'd expect people to, to see them in other species, uh, but the interactomes that people produce for other species may, may or may not include those proteins or may or may not observe interactions between them. Uh, so what we see is that there's not a whole lot of overlap between the data sets that are out there, but what there is overlap from, at least in some cases, includes uh, interactions involving proteins and fundamental function. Um, so the species that I'm talking about here just in brief include uh, uh, primarily E. coli, Campylobacter jejuni. Uh, in total there's there's just about 349 different bacterial species, uh, but species like E. coli and Campylobacter jejuni and uh, the syphilis pyrochete, uh, Germinio pallidum, um, tend to make up the, the bulk of the, the interactions that we see here. So most of the interactions are from a, a small subset of species. Um, so here's another hairball. Uh, in this case, it's the consensus meta interactome, um, and of course, hairballs on their own don't necessarily show us a whole lot, uh, but they can give us an idea of the complexity of the network. In this case, it is very complex, um, even despite the fact that I've compressed this this network of um, more than 50,000 interactions into about 42,000 interactions between uh, more than 7,000 orthologous groups. Uh, we see that these each of these these nodes, that is, the orthologous groups. Um, have more than 11 neighbors per node on average. Some of them actually have quite a few. Uh, so we need some ways to, to trim this back a little bit. Um, so in this case, I decided to trim it back just to interactions that we have actually seen um, at least three times. And as, as we, we saw a couple slides ago, uh, that's quite a bit of a minority of the network. So in this case, it brings us back to just, uh, just around 500 uh, orthologous groups and 784 uh, edges between them. Um, so once again, because we've compressed this on the basis of orthology, uh, a number of the uh, the interactions that we uh, 
that we may not have seen duplicated in other contexts um, are are compressed into into individual interactions here. So at this point, we have about two neighbors per node on average, and a much more simple network to work with. Uh, and we can see that the function of interactions overall that in that consensus meta interact dome um, seems to be enriched for proteins of a known function. Unsurprisingly, uh, that is many of the interactions, despite the fact that proteins of a known uh, function uh, don't make up a majority of the interactions in the network, uh, do in fact make up uh, very many of the the interactions that we see by function. Now, some of this may be because uh, proteins of unknown function end up being kind of a, a catch-all category for anything that we don't have function for. Um, but we do see here at least that they also interact quite commonly uh, with things like, in this case, category J is um, proteins involved in translation. Uh, so we know that there are many protein interactions out there that are representing um, some kind of unknown interaction, or at least an interaction with a, an unknown function. Um, with a otherwise rather critical uh, protein function that is something having to do with translation, which we know is essential to uh, life and not just bacterial life either. So those are the translated for functions there, PJ, um, as compared to the poorly characterized or unknown functions. So overall, uh, we've seen the bacterial interaction data is quite a bit less conserved than we expected, uh, but a meta interactum can help to address this issue by uh, providing a way in which we can uh, establish interaction predictions. We can provide some context for those proteins of unknown function, especially in their categories of, uh, of functional interactions. Uh, and we can, it allows us to create uh, new interaction screens that would build on previous results in a better way. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily make sense to establish a completely new protein burden interactome uh, unless we know what we'd be likely to expect. Um, so it leads us to the question uh, in the, the heart bd 2 k context here, whether we can assemble a cardiac interactome, and also why would we even want to do that? Uh, well, luckily, we do um, have the, the great benefit of having uh, very extensive heart proteome data, uh, perhaps most recently uh, from the paper shown here below by uh, Edward Lau et al., um, in which they created a data set of protein dynamics, or that is protein turnover in the mammalian heart proteome. So in this case, that's a, a mouse heart. Uh, and that's a really critical concept since we know that both relationships between proteins change over time, uh, but even the proteins themselves can change over time. One particular protein, when expressed, doesn't stay around forever. Uh, and knowing how rapidly that, that turnover, turnover occurs can be really critical to understanding uh, not only that protein itself, but differences under different conditions, uh, say, uh, heart disease model conditions. Uh, at least that's what they did in this case. Um, now, of course, because much of the proteome data is from mouse studies, it may make sense to apply more of a meta-interactome-based approach. Um, that is, we can, we can take data that we've already seen in, say, let's say, human proteins or even protein studies from other species and compare them to what we see in the mouse. Um, so in this case, I'm going to talk a little bit about protein turnover, and I'm going to show you a network. Um, so this is a bit of a hairball, um, but this is what you get when you start with the uh, 3,000 or so proteins that Lau et al. discussed as um, having uh, results from their protein turnover studies. So now that's not even necessarily all the proteins present in the mammalian heart, um, but this is uh, just a subset of them, and we still see, see that we get uh, once we compare them to the interactions that we extract from intact as of quite recently. Uh, that still leaves us with more than 2,000 nodes. So once again, each protein is an individual node here. Uh, and more than 4,000 edges. Uh, interestingly enough, there's a very high degree node right in the middle of that network, and that is uh, 1433 uh, protein epsilon, which is a uh, protein known to be implicated in a number of different signaling pathways. In this case, it's found to have more than 1,900 edges, which uh, is a lot. That's that's a lot for, for any network to have interactions from. So if we were to drop that protein out of our network, we may not even have uh, much of a, a consistent uh, single network anymore. Um, now, if we want to look at that in terms of protein turnover results, we may need to filter it back a little bit. So in this case, uh, I've just filtered it back to the uh, proteins that we know we have uh, both control and uh, test results from for a, a single strain of, of mice used in the study, so that leaves us with about 1,200 nodes and more than 2,000 edges. Uh, and if we identify the, the proteins in this network that seem to have the, uh, the greatest difference between, in this case, the control situation and a uh, situation in which uh, the mouse is serving as a model of a hypertrophic heart, so that's kind of a, a heart disease example, um, then we see that the difference in protein turnover rate uh, for, for just about 
20 of these proteins is, is quite major. So those are instances in which um, we may want to focus on the more, both in an individual protein complex and in terms of the protein interactions, to determine why this difference in protein rate is there under those, those heart disease model conditions. And of course, that's not even just about binary interactions, but also interactions potentially two steps away in a network, as we know that proteins don't necessarily just interact with, with one protein at a time. So this is actually something that Edward Lau um, has gone into a bit, um, but I'm interested in uh, extending it even further into a network direction. Um, now, of course, we can do what I, I did in one of those earlier meta-interactive meta networks and just kind of restrict this, these interactions to those that we've observed in at least two different publications. Uh, that ends up removing most of our network and leaving us with only about 71 nodes. Uh, but in this case, uh, we do still have a uh, rather large uh, set of uh, nodes shown at, at left here, and it turns out that the that central node to which we see two of our are highlighted, and that is uh, highly highly different uh, protein nodes there uh, interact. Um, so that central node is another 1433 protein. So uh, unsurprisingly, these 1433 proteins uh, may actually be uh, rather common interactors, and we may, uh, in some networks, even wish to omit them if we actually want to see other other interactions. So overall, uh, and to summarize here, uh, we've seen that protein complex conservation is highly variably conserved across species, uh, but may in fact provide alternative phylogenetic markers for bacteria, uh, and that's handy because it mostly respects the existing taxonomy. Uh, in terms of interaction conservation, we've seen that it's quite a bit less shared between data sets than expected, especially based on the, the conservation of protein complexes that we saw in the previous section. Um, but that interaction conservation may still be useful for predicting interactions once we assemble a meta-interactome. But in terms of heart protein interactions, which is what I've been focusing on more now, uh, those interactions may reveal clusters of proteins with related properties and functions, especially if we view them in the context of experimental studies. So what does all this mean in, in kind of a, a broader context? Um, in short, I'd like to think the interactomes work better together. Uh, that's not terribly surprising, as we, we know we usually want more data. People usually don't want less data unless they're trying to filter it back. Um, but also the interactomes need to extend beyond single species to be truly useful. Um, in terms of cross-bacterial interactomes, um, that means potentially expanding it to an entire microbiome. We've heard a lot about um, microbiomes and especially disrupting microbiomes lately, but perhaps that may be the only way in which we can understand interactions uh, across bacterial species is by considering uh, not just interactions within a particular species, but interactions in a cross-species context. Um, in this case, I'd also like to think that uh, interactomes and meta-interactomes in particular would be good models for cardiovascular protein interactions. Um, they can also identify weak points among protein networks. Um, we know this because we know that, that some interactions tend to uh, be more critical to a network than others. For bacteria, these may represent things like potential drug targets. Uh, for heart proteins, uh, these may be individual proteins where when disrupted, uh, you're disrupting entire regulatory pathways that are essential to cardiac function. So networks really help to reveal those kind of things. Uh, and I'm right, I've, I've just shown a reminder of the fact that uh, antibiotic resistance is a growing problem, so let's not forget about that bacteria either. Um, so with that, I'd like to wrap up and, and thank everyone who helped with this work, and uh, especially where I am now. Um, so at PCU, I was with Oots Lab, and that's where I did uh, most of this work with uh, bacterial protein protein interactions. Um, we also had some uh, very helpful collaborators, including um, Dr. Raj Kapala at the JCVI, uh, Stefan Bukti at University of Miami, and uh, Mohan Babu at the University of Regina. Uh, but now I'm at the Heart BD2K, so I'd like to thank everyone uh, here and at the BD2K CCC, uh, as well as everyone uh, involved in uh, the greater NIH BD2K programs, as well as everyone here for listening. So with that, I'll take any questions. I see. All right. So someone let me know. Did you use the E. coli protein complexes from the complex portal? Actually, I so I considered using those, but I think at the time I started this study, I uh, the complex portal was not yet ready to go, um, and I think I uh, I sent some emails to to Sandra Orchard at, at one point. Um, Hi, Harry. So yes, Sandra. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh. Yes, yes. There we go. Um, 
So we now have about, uh, well, obviously you've completed the, the E. coli work, I assume, but uh, yes, we haven't got the complete uh, uh, list of complexes finished yet for E. coli, but we are still working on them, uh, and okay. they are now the formats that will be a lot more useful for you to use, I think. Uh, we're also working on human as well, so uh, if you're moving into that direction with the uh, cardiac work, um, we've actually had a bit of a focus on that uh, through, not with the BD2K work, but through another collaboration with the uh, go, uh, cardiovascular go annotation group at uh, UCL. Right. So we've, we've already got quite a lot of cardiac specific complexes in there, uh, and we're always happy to add to them. Uh, and intact is growing all the time, so if there's anything we can do to help you with this work, then just let me know. Right, that, that's great to hear. Yeah, intact has been an invaluable resource yeah. so far. Um, and yeah, I was I was really excited to see that this this complex portal has been has been growing. Um, so yeah, that'll that'll be an absolutely essential research for for all further work in this in this project. Yes, we're currently at the moment uh, um, bringing the DIP data in because uh, you know that, well, I don't know, but if you know, but Intact is big, part of a bigger IMEX collaboration and increasing the data is being centered in Intact so we can put it out as a single data set. So the one outstanding set was DIP, which of course right. is only five minutes away from you anyway, uh, but we are now working with them to import that data so we'll be able to put it out as a single set. So as soon as we announce that, then there'll be a big jump in the amount of uh, data we have available as well. Oh, that's that's perfect. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Do we have any other questions? If not, thank you again, Harry, for your presentation, and thank you for everybody who attended, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone.